Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. This morning we want to um, continue the topic that we started last week. And um, it is far above, far above part two. Last week we spoke about the implication of the fact that we are seated far above principalities and powers and uh, the implication of that sitting position in our individual lives. Today the Lord would help us as we will be looking at this divine positioning as regards to the implication its implication to our world and our mission. You know, when we, a lot of us, when we think about the benefits that we enjoy in redemption, the peace that we have with God the freedom from sin uh, and the bondage of sin, the eternal life that we have received. It's very easy for us to believe that the only purpose, the primary and the only purpose in saving his people is that God wants to bless us. We readily view salvation as man-centered. And we often regard our well-being as God's chiefest concern. Obviously, we cannot take away from the Lord's genuine love for his people. Because scripture tells us he loves us with an everlasting love. But the truth is that the word of God also says that one of the most important reasons for our salvation is God's glory. God's glory is the reason why he saved us. And so it is not a surprise what Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, when we are, he says that God has given us a mission. A lot of Christians live their lives with little or no awareness of the phenomenal spiritual realities around us. Most of us go through our days, day to day, hardly feeling the impact of the magnitude of what we became when we gave our lives to Christ. And we see ourselves as ordinary people. And we tend to want to default to ordinary things just as the world but the truth is that we are not ordinary people we are a people that have received power and authority from the almighty God and so our lives need to reflect the flavor of the power and the authority that we have received from God I pray that this morning that more of us would understand the mission that we have after we have given our lives to God, to Jesus, and begin to walk in this mission in order to achieve it. I pray that this morning that the Lord will open our eyes so that we can see that all of us believers have peculiar gifts that we are meant to bring to the 
plate on this mission that God has given to his church. Again, this morning I have two main text, texts. The first one is one of the ones I read last week, which is Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 to verse 7. He says, but God who, in rich, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the age to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. What do we see in this text? This is text one. We see that Jesus was raised, no, yes, from the dead. And we see that we were raised with him. We see that we are seated together with him in heavenly places. We see that we are far above principalities and powers. We see that we have been given um, an assignment to show the exceeding riches of his grace. If we look at the text number two today, forget my numbering there. It's Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 to verse 11. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 to verse 11. It says, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Sometimes there's something that amazes me. That sometimes we Christians read scriptures and through the eyes of who we think we are, we interpret, um, to interpret the scripture differently because we think that can't be me. That is too much for me as a mere mortal. And so we do not readily accept that scripture. I remember some years ago I was in a prayer meeting and I heard someone pray I hope that we have learned more and have do not pray like that. And this person said, Father, come and bind all these spirits that trouble our sister. And so I opened my eyes and I looked at the person and then I shook my head and I closed my eyes back. Do you know why? That's ignorance. Whatever happened to Matthew 18, 18? That says whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. It means you are to do the binding. I remember many years ago when I just gave my life to Christ. I read the scripture in Isaiah 54 verse 17. That says no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, you shall condemn. And then I went to um, who I call my mother in the Lord. 
The lady who actually discipled me, God used her to disciple me. And I said to her, what is the meaning of the scripture? And I read it to her. I can never forget the, the expression on her face when I said to her, what does that mean? Am I to condemn? She said, read it again. And so I read it again. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against me in judgment, you, I shall condemn. That's me paraphrasing now, personalizing it. She said, what does it say? I said, it said, I shall condemn. I said, so what's the question? <laughs> Do you know that a lot of us are like this? We read scriptures and we think, that can't be right. Maybe that's a, a, a typographical error. That scripture should have said that God will come and teach the principalities and powers his own manifold wisdom. But that's not what he says. That scripture is saying that the church will teach principalities and powers in heavenly places his manifold wisdom. I've had people interpret the scripture to mean that the church would teach the earthly principalities and powers. You know there are earthly principalities and powers. Those in authority and in government and so on. And there are scriptures that talk about such principalities in Titus chapter 3 verse 1. But this particular scripture is not referring to principalities and powers in the earthly places. It is referring to principalities and powers in the heavenly places. And what does this mean? It means that it's talking about spiritual beings, not human beings. In order for us to understand what we are saying this morning properly, I would attempt to answer three questions. And that will be the whole sermon. The first question is, who are these principalities and powers? And I'd like us to see what the scripture says about principalities and powers. I'll be looking at five, six different scriptures. The first one is Romans chapter 6, chapter 8. Verse 37 to verse 39. In this passage, Paul was saying, please open your Bibles with me. I may not read all of them because of time. In this passage, Paul makes the point that there is none in heaven or on earth that can separate us believers from God's love. And in that list, you will find principalities and powers included. In this context, Principalities and powers can mean demonic forces themselves, but it can also mean people empowered by demonic forces to come against the truth and to deceive men. Now, second scripture, Colossians chapter 1 verse 6. In this scripture, it is said that principalities and powers are among the created beings made by God for his own purpose. And so, Whatever form of principalities and power are made by God. Now the third scripture is Colossians chapter 2 verse 15. Where he talks about what Jesus did. Where he says that he spoiled principalities and powers. And he made a public spectacle of them. Triumphing over them by the cross. These principalities and powers being mentioned here are spiritual principalities not earthly or physical principalities. And then we go to number four, our text for today, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 to verse 11. It talks about principalities and powers in heavenly places. And so these are not earthly principalities and powers. These are spiritual beings that it's talking about. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, we find, if you read from verse 11, it's talking about putting on the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
For we are not contending against, you know, now verse 12 says, it says we are not contending or we are not warring against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the world rulers of the present darkness and against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. This particular set of principalities and powers that the Bible is talking about in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 are not earthly beings. These are spiritual beings. Hence the scripture says that we wrestle not. We are contending not against flesh and blood. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And then Titus chapter 3 verse 1 which I made reference to earlier which um, is talking about earthly authorities and governments who are ultimately placed over us by God. By God. So, the um, principalities and powers that, that our text of today is referring to is the same one being referred to in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 that are not flesh and blood but are spiritual beings. Spiritual beings that are af uh, affected because of this world. Therefore, the principalities and powers that our, our text is talking about are supernatural hosts in the league of the enemy of Satan the devil who have influence on the course of this age, its people, its inventions, and its institutions. They are beings to whom the church is called to demonstrate the manifold wisdom of God. And so God is saying, you are seated far above principalities and powers in heavenly places, not just as a decoration, but that you will show principalities and powers the wisdom of God. Now the quest, second question I would like us to answer this morning is, what is the manifold wisdom of God that we are to make known to the principalities and powers? What are they? What are the things that we are to show the principalities and powers? We are to prove to the principalities and powers. Now, the truth is that the principalities and powers, they know that God saved man. They know that God has put us over them. They know that God has put the whole world as one church, Jew and Gentile, to worship him as one body. They know that the body of Christ, contrary to what people are saying, is a force that must be reckoned with because it's daily multiplying. But what they do not understand is how this came to be. The same way that the devil did not understand that killing Jesus on the cross will bring doom to, his, to him and his kingdom. They do not understand. It is our responsibility as children of God to make known the wisdom of God. And how shall we do this? Number one, how God saved us and how God saved us. How God saved sinful man without losing his divine justice. God I mean, Son of God, Jesus, the Son of God left heaven, took upon himself the physical human body in the incarnation. And the Bible says that he that knew no sin, who was also tested on all points, according to Hebrews chapter um, 4 verse 15, was crucified on the cross, shedding his blood for the atonement of sin. The just debt of sin was paid by the blood of the Son of God. At the same time, he paid the penalty for our sin, upholding the righteous judgment of God and yet showing mercy, dying in love for fallen souls. What we lost at Eden, we gained 
at the cross. Satan is stung by his own venom. Death is destroyed by its own captive. Romans chapter 5 verse 10 says, For if we, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled, reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 55 says, O oh death, where is your sting? O oh hate, where is your victory? As in Adam all died, even so in Christ we all are made alive. As by one man, Adam, sin came to this world and death by sin. So by one man, Christ Jesus is sin destroyed and life and immo life immortal brought to man. The wisdom of God. We are to teach the principalities and powers the wisdom of God in the salvation of man. Secondly, what are we meant to teach these principalities and powers? We are meant to show them what God can do with sinful men. Every one of us was made, marred by sin. Like the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 verse 23. That all we have sinned. And worthy of damnation. As the Bible says in Romans chapter 6 verse 23. That the wages of sin is death. But Jesus Christ came. And he died for us. That we might be forgiven. Man in all our weakness and all our sin. With a, with a nature which wrecked itself. Was yet made in the image of God. Then God at work upon the wreck. To produce the results. Not only wonderful in themselves. But doubly wonderful. Because of the conditions. Think of what was wrought in sinful, sinful man. People who were murderers and adulterers and homosexuals and thieves and covetous and drunkards and so on changed to saints. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 to verse 11, Apostle Paul says, that the chiefest sinners turned to it to an apostle. He called himself the chiefest sinner. Turned to an apostle. He said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13 to verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13 to verse 16. He says, although I was formerly, formerly a blasphemer, a, prosecu a prosecutor, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. But Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And however, for this reason, I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Formerly a blasphemer. Formerly a persecutor of the brethren. Formerly sinners. How God can change a sinner. What God did in the life of of sinners and turn them to saints. What God did in your life and in my life and turn us to saints, not by our power, not by might, but by the Spirit of God, through the grace of God, we are saved and we are His children 
members of his kingdom today. We can show the principalities and powers that it does not end with the life of a sinner. That it is not finished because Christ went to the cross and at any point in time when he calls a man, he begins a work of transformation in the life of a man and he changed a man who nobody would look upon, who is condemned, even by human standards, and he changes that man to a saint. He wants us to teach principalities and powers that God has the power to save, not only to save in, 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 in the, uh, in, in, that, like we say it in words, but in the reality, because he transforms the life of a man. And that is the reason why I say that when you come to Christ, there must be fruit of repentance. People must see that your life has been transformed. The day we had the picnic at Chatsworth's house, someone came to me and he said, I thank God for what has happened to my brother. I know who he is and I know who, who he was and I know who he is today. He is totally changed. He is totally transformed. When the principalities and powers see transformed people by the power of God, they learn the wisdom of God. They understand the power of God. They understand that God can change the life of a person. If there's someone in this room this morning, you believe that you know God and you are not seeing anything changing in your life, you need to remember visit it again. For adventure there is no genuine repentance. For adventure there is no genuine salvation because a genuinely saved person is a changed person transformed by the power of God. Hallelujah. We are to show by the transformation that exists in our lives to principalities and powers that God has the power to change a man. Amen. Number three, how are we to change to what are we to teach besides principalities and powers? We have to teach how the lost dominion at the Garden of Eden is restored back to believers. Our text today says that at his resurrection we are raised together with him from our helpless, dead state to sit with him in heavenly places, the place of dominion, the place of authority, the place of rulership, the place where we will be reigning with him. And it can reign here on earth through us. He has given us authority as the word of God says, the Bible says in Luke chapter 10 verse 19, where it says, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. It means that we are not wimps, spiritual wimps. It means that we are a people that have authority. It means that we are people that should be in control of things. By the power of God that is working in us. The power of the Spirit of God that is working through us. We are a people that the enemy should not mess with. Like my American friends will say. We are a people that the enemy should not be able to joke with. Mark chapter 16 verse 16 to 18 says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow them that believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I looked at this scripture many, many times. And I was looking for the word that said that these signs will believe and we follow all the pastors and church leaders that in my name they will cast out demons and so on. I looked and looked many, many times, you know. I have looked at least once a year for the past 34 years. That is at least 34 times. 
I haven't found it. Because it does not say pastors and church leaders. It says all that believe. Amen. It means you and I. And so we're not supposed to be fretting people. We're not supposed to be afraid of the devil. Because we have the power of God walking in us and walking through us. Because we have been given authority by the one who has authority. By the only authority that matters. The one that the Bible says is in charge in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Philippians chapter 2 from verse 9 says it's been given a name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. He is the one that is in charge of all things. Physical and spiritual. Animate or inanimate. Whatever it is, is in control. The Bible even says that he is above principalities. is on the head of all principalities and powers. The one who is the head of all principalities and powers says, I am now giving you that authority. I am now giving you that dominion. In my name, begin to do this on my behalf. I have finished what I have got to do. It's your turn to begin to show principalities and powers what my wisdom is. It's your turn to begin to show principalities and powers what power I have. If they did not understand and they undermine the almighty God that he had to cast them down. Mere mortals, created beings, I will show them that I have power and I am in charge. That is your mission here on earth. Hallelujah. Glory to God. People of God, stand tall. We are already victorious. We are the triumphant church of Jesus Christ. We are not victims to the kingdom of darkness. We are victors. Not victims. And I pray that the Lord, our God, will give you grace Give me grace. Empower us all to actually live out the life that he has ordained unto us, the life he has already given to, to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. You remember, I've always told you I'm one of the crazy ones. I remember many years ago, I had a group of friends who were young, who were young then. Maybe that's why we were not fearful. <laughs> If you mention into our hearing that there is a work of darkness prospering there, mm. we go there. That's what we did. Amen. <laughs> we didn't run away. We went there. I've shared to you many years ago when we went to start a pioneering work in a village in Africa, in Nigeria, in Africa. Heavily demonized village. Every corner had a shrine. A shrine to a god. It was like every family had a god. Yeah. And in such places, what you see, obviously there's death. Because there is intense manifestation of the, of the activities of witchcraft in that place. And as we prayer walked the first day, what did we see? Every, like, third houses or fourth houses were coffin makers. The trade in that village was making coffins. And there was this general understanding that every first child, male or female, would never live above age 40. And because they believed it, all first children died before or at age 40. Heavy demonic oppression in that place. And God sent us there. And we went there. And we began to pray. And then we organized crusades. And <laughs> the first night, 
Nobody came out of their house for the crusade. And so we did the crusade by, all by ourselves. We did the prayer, the praise and worship, the preaching to ourselves. <laughs> the following morning, we did door-to-door -door evangelism. During the evangelism, a young girl, maybe around 9 or 10, got healed of ulcer in one of the eyes that was as big as that. This is not an exaggeration. It was as big as that. And hands were laid upon her, and by evening, it had gone flat. Yeah. And so, in the evening, they came and stood outside the fence of where we had the crusade. And we started inquiring what the problem was. They were afraid of their gods. And they believed that we would soon die. Because according to them, nobody mentioned the name of their gods in public and stayed alive. And we were addressing this God through our PA system. And so they were looking for us to die. I'm sure that the coffin makers would have been thinking we've got business. <laughs> People of God, in the night of the second night, I believe, some people in our company went to the shrine of the gods. I told you we don't run away, we, we advance. Because we have the almighty God behind us. We went to the shrine at midnight. And we commanded the spirits to desert. And in the day, we would do door-to-door -door evangelism. And the evening we had a crusade and the whole village came. The whole village came and God did amazing things. Just before we finished the crusade, the high priests of the main God, God have mercy, <laughs> in the village came and said to us, I want to know your God. He said, because I have been in my shrine mm. for the past how many hours mm. and my God has refused to Amen. answer me. Mm. Because we told him the night before to leave. Yeah. Mm. And so he could not answer. Mm. And so he gave his life to Christ. Amen. Today, I think it's about 20 years ago now, we have six churches in that area. The village has become a town. It's now prospering. The main trade is no longer making of coffins. And people are living more than 40 years. Glory to God. That is who we are called to be. To show principalities and powers the manifold wisdom of God. Number four. Jews and Gentiles reconciled to God in one body. In the Old Testament, Israel was God's chosen people. And he gave them the unique benefits of his covenant, his law, his worship, his promises, and all that. But when Jesus came, glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. He came to accomplish. He, he came that salvation might, become, might be for both Jews and Gentiles. And that both Jew and Gentile might inherit the promises of God and be one body. The Bible says that he broke down the wall of partition between Jews and Gentiles. And so it does not matter who we are anymore. In Ephesians chapter 2, if you read verse 12 to verse 14, Apostle Paul was saying in that scripture that we who were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in this world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off, have been brought near in the blood of Jesus. For he is our peace who has made both Gentiles and Jew one 
and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. So the mystery of Christ is that in his death on the cross, he purchased not just eternal life for individuals who trust him or who are Jews, but he purchased a church, hallelujah, a church composed of Jews and Gentiles who are both heirs of God's promises and beneficiaries of God's grace. And lastly, multiplication of the church. If you remember that Jesus Christ called 12, 12 disciples, including Judas Iscariot. But after Jesus came, the church was multiplied in a way that the kingdom of darkness did not understand. Because when he killed Jesus, he thought that was the end of this nonsense. He thought that was the end of Jesus and that was the end of Christianity. At Pentecost, 3,000 was added to the church. In a short time, it grew to 5,000. In a short time, the scripture began to describe it as multitude because it could not count anymore. 2,000 years later, can you imagine how many have come to know Jesus to put their faith in him and are worshipping him? Until tomorrow, the enemy cannot stop the church, no matter what he does, no matter any the laws that are being created, no matter what the governments of the world are saying. No matter what any person in the world may say, the Christian church cannot be stopped. The word of God cannot be broken. The church is marching on and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. In the today, the multiplication is continuing and it will continue in the name of Jesus. I will answer the last question quickly. How do we make the wisdom known? Number one, you and I have got to preach the gospel. Wherever you find yourself. I was telling some of my friends last night, if anybody comes as close as three feet to you, it needs to hear the gospel in different ways and manner. In different ways and manner. You don't have to bash them with the Bible in the head. That's a word I came to learn in this country. <laughs> Bible bashing. Because at home, actually, Bible bashing is the lifestyle. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to Bible bash them. But in many ways and several ways, we preach the gospel. Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. For everyone who believes, for the Jews first and also for the Greek, we preach the gospel because it is the only way that men can be saved. The only name by whom, by which men can be saved is the name of Jesus. The gospel is the way that God has given unto us to save for the salvation of the souls of men. And so we must preach the gospel. You must share your faith with people. You cannot afford to be quiet, people. You must speak out the mysteries of God to people and let the Holy Spirit take it from there and finish the work because it's the one. You and I cannot save anybody. I'm sure you know that. You know, but he's the one that convicts. He's the one that convinces. He's the one that will bring them to that point of salvation, to that saving grace. Because of time number two, how shall we teach this wisdom? How shall we make this wisdom known? By living a life that shows that we have been delivered from the bondage of sin. Apostle Paul was saying in Romans chapter 6, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No. We have to live a life that will make those around us to know that we have been delivered from the bondage of sin. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 to verse 13, in the New Living Translation, I find the New Living Translation very, very um, 
informative, very good. It says, dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. God is working within us, giving us the power and the desire to do what pleases him. And all we need to do is to cooperate with him so that he can continue the work that the Bible says that uh, the work of changing us to the image of the Son from glory to glory so that there will be continuous transformation in our lives. It is important that we live that life, that we show anyone around us that indeed, Tony has changed. Indeed, God has done a work in her life. And when the principalities and powers see that we are putting our bodies under subjection, that we are living the life that we have received, they understand that indeed the power of God to save and deliver is real. And we are the evidence of that. Number three, and the last one because of our time, we need to exert our authority like the disciples did. In Acts of the Apostles, um, chapter 3, we see Peter and Paul heal the lame man at the beautiful gate. People of God, if you don't lay your hands on the sick, how shall they recover? It is important that you lay your hands on the sick. It doesn't have to be the pastor that will do it. You are a believer. You have believed. And so lay your hands on the sick. You, are, you do not have the ability to, to heal. Pastor does not have the ability to heal. All those ones that they call miracle workers, they are no miracle workers. The only miracle worker is Jesus Christ himself. And so lay your hands on the sick and let God do what he can do. How will they be healed if you don't pray? How will they be healed if you don't lay your hands and apply your faith? Let's do it. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 16, if you read verse 16 to verse 18, I will not read because of time, but we see in the scripture how the slave girl who was possessed by the spirit of div um, divination, the Bible says that Paul, Paul and Silas casted out the spirit. It is our responsibility to cast out demons, to help people, to deliver people by casting out the demon that is tormenting them. That was what Jesus did while he was on earth. He spent his time casting out devils from people. He spent his time healing people and we are to do the same because he has already given us the authority to do so. People of God do the same. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 28, if you read verse 3, verse 5, and verse 6, you will see where the Bible says that Apostle Paul was gathering sticks, and while he was gathering sticks, um, in order to make fire, a viper came upon him and tied itself around his hand. The Bible says that the people around them thought that, well, Apostle Paul was going to die because of that, that Apostle Paul was going to die, and they watched him. Wait, waiting for him to die. The Bible says Apostle Paul just shook off the viper and he continued with what he was doing. And the people began to look. They looked for a long time, the Bible said, and saw that no harm came to him. What does Mark chapter 16 say about you, people of God? What does Mark chapter 16 say about you? It says they, can they shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall by no means hurt them. That is who you are, but you have got to believe. Anything you are ignorant of, the devil will rob you of it. And so you have got to believe what the word of God says. You have got to practice what the word of God says. You have got to exercise your faith. God has already finished the work. Jesus, when he came here, he finished the work. All you need to do is to walk in it. And the grace of God to walk in it will be released unto you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In conclusion this morning, I say, can you put the conclusion on? You are seated in heavenly places at the right hand of God. When he, looks at, when he looks at Jesus, he sees you. Realize that you occupy the place of authority and power in Christ. Far above principalities and powers. They are under you, not above you. Brethren, praise up. The target for the church is to demonstrate it to the evil powers that God has been wise in sending his son to die. That we might have hope and be unified in one body, the church. It is our responsibility to show and to make known to the principalities and powers the manifold wisdom of God. Would you do this? Would you engage in this mission? Would you live the life that you are supposed to be living? Would you focus on our assignment here on earth? Let us pray. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise. Lord, we honor you. I hope that somebody is encouraged this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
praise us. We give you praise. I have prayer points on the screen now. Would you please rise with me? And I would like you to just take these prayer points and just pray for yourself. One after the other. Just pray for yourself. For thanking God for the finished work of Calvary. The work that neither you or me, or, nor me can add to. Complete work that he did at Calvary. Thank him for the privilege that he's given to us in Christ Jesus. Thank him for the privilege that we have 